Hello everyone, and welcome to the energy unit of Phys 1101. So we're starting to talk about energy, and this is probably the most important idea in all of physics, and it has implications to all sorts of disciplines other than physics. To start, let's just talk about the general idea of a conservation law, and you've seen this with momentum. If we have a system, say two carts, in some initial state, then we can connect that with its final state using conservation of momentum. So if we know the momentums at the start, and we define the system as the two carts, then the total system momentum is just the sum of the two individual momentums, and we can do the same thing with the final state, and as long as the system is isolated, the initial and final momentums are the same, and we can use this equation to solve for things. So energy is very similar. Again, we define some system, say a ball and the earth, and then we can connect earlier times to later times by writing down the energy at each time, and then as long as the system is closed, we can write down that the initial energy is the same as the final energy, and again, we can often use this to solve for things. In some earlier course, you have probably come across the definition of energy that it is the capacity to do work. Well, let me ask you, is that clear? Are you satisfied with that definition? I mean, you know, think back about how acceleration is used in colloquial language between uh, versus the physicist's definition of acceleration. They're quite different, and so you might be worried about this word work. How do physicists define work? And so this definition isn't really that useful because it just forces us to define something else. So we are going to roughly define work now and more precisely define it later. But in fact, I'm going to show you another way of understanding the meaning of energy, which will be more useful to us for now until we can get around to a precise definition of work. So here's an example of a case where the everyday definition of work agrees with the physicist's definition. If you want to drive a nail, of course, obviously you have to exert a force on it, but it goes a little deeper than having to exert a force. For example, this is not how you drive a nail. This will never work. I am certainly exerting a force on the nail, but I will be totally unsuccessful in driving the nail. And so you could say that although I'm certainly going to some effort, I'm not doing any work. On the other hand, you, unlike me apparently, do know how to drive a nail, and so you know that you have to get the hammer moving. And when the hammer is moving, then it is able to do work on the nail. It's able to drive the nail in. So apparently when you get the hammer moving, it has the capacity to do work. It has energy. Well, there's another way to get the hammer to do work on the nail, although I don't recommend it as a way of driving a nail, but here it is. You can drop the hammer from some height on the nail. And this just shows you that when the hammer is higher up than the nail, it again has the capacity to do work. It has energy when it is high up. So why is it that I'm not doing any work in this situation where I'm pressing down on the nail? In the colloquial use, it's pretty obvious. No carpenter would ever be paid for this. It's not getting the job done because the nail is not being driven. But why does a physicist say no work is done here? So I am certainly exerting a force on the hammer, and in turn the hammer is exerting a force on the nail. And the perfectly normal look on my face is evidence that I'm expending effort. However, force is not the same thing as work, and work is not the same thing as effort. Um, so I can push all I want, and I still won't get any work done. The point is that when I have the hammer moving and it hits the nail, it drives the nail. And so it exerts a force on the nail while the nail is moving. And this is our condition for work to be done. A force must act on an object 
and the object must move for work to be done. That's good enough for now. We'll come back to work later, but right now let's go on to look at a different way to understand energy that's going to be more useful to us right at the moment. So, I'm going to suggest that rather than thinking of energy as the capacity to do work, I'm going to suggest that we should think of the energy of an object as that ob object's capacity to cause change, either to other objects or to itself. Now, you might not be satisfied with this either, because you might be suspicious that change now needs to be defined. But in fact, that's easy, because we mean any change. Changes in position, speed, shape, temperature, chemical composition, color, what have you, all involve energy to bring them about. And so, for example, in our situation where we were hammering the nail, the moving hammer was able to change the position of the nail. It drove it farther into the wood. Also, you will know if you've ever touched a nail after hammering it, the nail will have warmed up. Also, think about an egg in a frying pan. If you put an egg into a cool frying pan, it'll just sit there without changing. But if you put it into a hot pan, it's going to start changing very obviously. In particular, the first thing you'll notice is the white of the egg going from clear to white. And so a hot frying pan can change the egg. Or in other words, a hot frying pan has more energy than a cool frying pan. To check your understanding, let's consider a spring. In situation A, the spring is relaxed. And in situation B, we're talking about the same spring, but it is now compressed. And the spring is not moving in either situation. Does this spring have more energy in situation A or in situation B? Use the definition of energy that I just introduced.